Part thirteen of Alador by Henry Newbolt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapters thirty seven to thirty nine. Chapter thirty seven How Ewan came the second time to the hermit, and how he took counsel of him. Now Ewan fell swiftly earthward, and belike the time of his falling was no great space, but to him it seemed long beyond reckoning for his wits were battered and edge-worn as a stone is worn by a hundred years of rolling and whiles he dropped headlong through the void and whiles the wind came up beneath him and lifted him lightly so that he rose and fell as it were upon great waves of the sea but at the last he came hurtling down upon a forest and among the trees of it his wings were caught and broken yet was ewan not broken therewith but he took the earth easily and recovered himself then he got to his feet and began to go through the forest and it came to his mind that he was thrice lost and not once only for he was gone from his lady and from his friend and he knew not where to seek them nor in what place of the world he might himself be wandering and for enya he prayed to see her again in no long time for he knew how she could come and go by her own magic that was her gift of fairy but for hyperenor he lamented without praying for he supposed that he was gone beyond that and for himself he raged against fate for it seemed to him that his life had fallen suddenly from light to darkness as a lamp that is thrown down and though it be not broken yet it cannot be kindled again but cold it lies and blackened that was burning but a moment since and when he perceived that then he bit and beat against time as a wild thing will bite against the bars of a cage howbeit he continued still upon his way and suddenly he perceived that he was in no strange path for he was going between tall pines and beyond the pines was a stream that ran burbling and a bank with great beeches upon it and he went forward quickly as one that well knows what he shall find and as he thought so it fortuned to him for he came by sunrise to a bare lawn under a cliff and in the face of the cliff was a door carven and a window or two and it was the house of the hermit that was friend to him and right glad he was to see that place again and when he came there the sun was risen and the hermit was coming forth out of his house in like manner as he had done aforetime and in like manner he brought bread and broke it for the small fowls of the forest and ewan was amazed to behold his dealing for there had come no change upon the man nor upon the place nor upon anything therein but ewan only was changed within himself and made new by time and trouble then he stood still beneath a beech tree and called with a quiet voice and bade the hermit a good morning and the hermit moved not but answered him yet more quietly and continued feeding his birds so they too came together without ado or overmuch heartiness but inwardly they were quickened both as with memory and friendship and they went together to the stream and when they had given bread to the fishes then they did off their garments quickly and took the pool as they had done aforetime and they sported joyfully and so came home to break their fast together now as they sat at table ewan looked out from the window and he saw the sunlight upon the lawn and he heard the murmur of the stream for the sound of it came by upon a little wind of morning and he bethought him how the times were changed and all his mind unknown to the hermit who sat beside him then the hermit said to him we are strangely met again for in a year this place is nowise changed and i have gone but a little downward on the byway of my life but you have journeyed far to the forward and are come within sight of your desire and ewan was astonished and asked him how know you that which has befallen me for it is a long tale and i have not yet told a word of it and the hermit answered i know it not but there is little need of telling for i set you forth on your way to palador and therein you followed your desire and without doubt there met you by the way a woman for by every man's way there is a woman and without doubt you learned of her that which all women teach and for the rest you have encountered this and that adventure 
and though you have proved them well yet have you failed of your achievement on to this present for there is hope in your eyes and no certainty and you are here alone and wandering then ewan opened his heart and he told his story by part and by parcel until he had told it all and when he had ended his telling the hermit was silent and he sat there stilly and moved no more than if he had been lost in sleep and at the last ewan said to him that which i have done is it well done or ill then the hermit stirred a little and sighed deeply and so fell again to silence but afterwards he spoke and said to ewan forgive me for i was thinking of myself yet not of myself only but of you and of many for we are all banished men and we seek for the road of our returning and you do well on your part for your serving and your seeking are one and though you find not yet neither do you turn aside to rest for the time is not come wherein you must be content with memory and solitude and ewan looked upon him and he saw that he spoke out of sorrow for his eyes were like still water but deep within them the spirit of the man was troubled as the sand is troubled beneath the stillness of a spring and ewan longed greatly to comfort him but found no words for he would not question him of his sorrow then he thought to put him in mind of his wisdom that he had found by loneliness but thereto the hermit answered yet more sadly and said there are that choose loneliness but upon me it came perforce and for my wisdom it is one thing to you and another thing to me for to you it is as a living voice to counsel the living but to me it is as the stone upon a grave which gives good words when there is none left to hear them then ewan said to him what then will you return and come with me the hermit smiled a little and answered him not so for i shall be none the nearer to the country of my abiding but go you he said and return to the city and do your seeking among men for your life is yet to find and among men you must find it chapter thirty eight how ewan returned again to palador for to dwell there and how he spoke to appease a strife that was between the people so on that day ewan had converse with the hermit and on the morrow early he departed from him and he went from him by the former way but he went not after the former manner for at this time his journeying was by daylight and not by moonlight and he had no aid of horses but fared always upon his feet notwithstanding he made good speed and came betimes to the place of the stepping-stones and it seemed to him a place right dreary and desert where before had been his lady with him and great fighting upon the bank so he passed on quickly and came to palador and he saw the city also as a dim and dreary city for his heart was fordone with loneliness and his thought dragged like a man that is footsore with going then he came to the gate and passed in and immediately there came to meet him two men and they ran towards him on this side and on that and one of them was clad in scarlet and the other in black and they too laid hold on him both together and they spoke to him loudly as it were with one voice so that he heard not of their saying two words in twenty but when their ardour was somewhat abated then he heard them more plainly and their tale was this that the company of the eagle and the company of the tower were at odds together and some of them were even now within the great hall of the city speaking the one against the other and like enough to go further with it and as for them which took hold of ewan they had the office from their companies to wait within the gate and if any should enter to send him quickly to the place of meeting and they offered ewan badges of the tower and of the eagle and were urgent with him each for his own that ewan might declare himself as of that company for they knew him not or else they had forgotten or belike they thought to carry him away with words and when he heard their clamouring and knew not for what cause the striving might be then at the first his spirit was sick within him and he thought to break away from them and he said to them let me go my way for i have enough business of my own and again he said let me go for i am weary and would rest but when he had spoken these words he saw the men no longer neither the red nor the black 
but he saw beside him the hermit standing and looking into his face then the hermit took him by the hand and began to lead him towards the market-place and as they went he spoke not to ywain but held him always by the hand and it was as though his mind was poured into ywain's mind like wine that is poured from one cup into another and ywain knew whither he went and he made no more resistance for he said within himself this is the life of palador to strive by companies and i know of which company i am then he thought again upon the eagles and his blood leapt up to be with them and he hastened in his going and knew not that he hastened and in that moment the hermit was gone from him and he came alone into the market-place now there was gathered in the place a crowd exceeding great and turbulent and they were plainly divided between the two companies for they which favoured the tower stood upon the steps of the great hall in a ground of vantage and they which were of the eagles stood in the street below and they were waiting until their men should come forth to them from within the hall and as they waited they gibbered and gibed the one party against the other but when they saw ywain they left that and shouted at him altogether for they remembered him and desired him each company for their own and the eagles desired him because he had fought for them aforetime and they of the tower desired him because he had fought against them and worsted them so that between them ywain thought to be divided piecemeal but in that moment the doors of the great hall were opened and they which were within began to come forth and there came before them a crier with a bell and he stood upon the topmost step and rang his bell and cried and ywain heard of his crying the last word only and they of the tower caught up that word and shouted joyfully he's banished then the eagles shouted he shall not be banished and their shouting was the louder and by some deal the fiercer and they called to ywain to help them and they made way and pushed him forward upon the steps then he went slowly up the steps and he stood and looked upon the crowd and as he stood he cast about in his mind what he should say for of the matter in dispute he knew but this word only that one was in danger to be banished so from that word he began his speaking and he said first how that to banish any man was an evil custom against kindness and against reason both for if a man had done wrong he should suffer there where he had done the wrong seeing that it was his country notwithstanding and secondly he said how that in any case a man should suffer by law and not by hatred for he may offend a whole company and yet be no law-breaker nor of evil intent and thirdly he said that to speak against customs is lawful for a custom may be such as was good yesterday but in no wise good to-day nor for ever and to end it is no murder and all this he spoke not angrily but with a sad voice and a slow and from fierce the crowd became gentle and they murmured continually for pleasure as a cat will purr when she is stroked with the hand for they of palador love best to see fighting but after that they love to hear speaking and he that hath power of wind may raise their anger at his own will and lay it again like the waters of the sea so they were stilled and put in peace together as for this time and they left the market-place and departed each to his own business but they of the tower forswore not their intent for they held by their custom and hated ywain but they perceived well that they must abide their time chapter thirty nine how ywain beheld a game of children and heard their singing now ywain stood still to see the crowd departing and of them which came near to him there were some which greeted him and some which looked sullenly upon him and as he saw them he thought upon the fashion of this world wherein all men are homeless for though a man dwell where he will and see good days yet everywhere he will be at strife with some and be like with many then he thought to go to his own house and he came there and entered into it but when he was therein he looked about him doubtfully for he could not tell if it should still be his own or given to another so he stayed not there but went forth again he knew not whither for his wits wandered otherwhere 
but his feet lightly found out the ways of his desire and the time was the time of sunset and there went a great thunder over the city and a sudden rain and when the rain ceased there was a light in the air and a marvellous clearness and it seemed to ewan as though that clearness was in his eyes also and in his mind and in his heart and he went wandering in joy so he came to a gate of the city and marked it not but passed through it and beyond the gate he saw suddenly the high steep before him grey and green and upon it was a company of children singing and making merry for they had run forth after the ceasing of the rain and there beyond them was the sea shining like grey steel and the trees were dark against it and the sky was heavy above with bands of purple but between the bands the colour of it was pale and cool and like to the colour of green apples then ewan stood still to look upon the sea and the sky and the children came round about him and looked also and as they stood looking there passed a cloud over the shepherdine sands and the cloud was drawn down upon the white water and it was the last cloud of the storm going west before the wind and the passing away of it was like the drawing of a curtain for immediately there was light instead of darkness upon the shepherdine sands and upon all the region that was beyond and in the light there was a land as it were far off but exceeding clear and upon the land was a steep and a city and by seeming it was no strange city for it was built and bullocked after the very fashion of palador notwithstanding it was strange enough for it was small and bright as a city that is painted in a book and the light wherewith it shone was a light of dawn and not of sunset and as ewan looked upon the city it seemed to him that the light was upon his own eyes also and upon his mind and upon his heart and he named the land aloud and called it alador and the children that were beside him heard the word that he spoke and immediately they broke into shouting after the manner of children and ran busily from one to another among themselves and ewan perceived that they would play at a game together and by seeming the game was called the game of alador and at the first he marvelled but afterwards he marvelled no more for he remembered how that it was forbidden to speak that name in all the city and how that the desire of children is ever to do and to say that which is forbidden to them then he went a little aside and stood within the gateway and looked forth to see the playing of that pastime and he saw how the children departed them into two bands which stood a line the one over against the other and their pastime was the singing of a song and they sang it as it were an antiphony verse answering to verse and they kept the time full orderly with their hands and with their feet and the verses of the song were in number six and the words of it were these to alador to alador who goes the pilgrim way who goes with us to alador before the dawn of day oh if we go the pilgrim way tell us tell us true how do they make their pilgrimage that walk the way with you oh you must make your pilgrimage by noonday and by night by seven years of the hard hard road and an hour of starry light oh if we go by the hard hard road tell us tell us true what shall they find in alador that walk the way with you you shall find dreams in alador all that ever were known and you shall dream in alador the dreams that were your own oh then oh then to alador we'll go the pilgrim way to alador to alador before the dawn of day now these were all the verses which the children sang but when they had sung them all they sang the last verse again and yet again and as they sang they turned them about and they went by two and by two along the edge of the green steep after the manner of lovers or of friends which go together on pilgrimage and when ewan saw that his heart burned his eyes for even in the playing of the children he beheld an image of his own life but they went from him quickly for they continued still in their singing and their marching and they passed by a tower that was in the wall and ewan saw them no more 
but he heard their singing far off when they were long gone from him and at the last he knew not in truth whether he heard it or heard it not but only he knew that the sound of it was still abiding with him End of part thirteen. Part fourteen of Alador by Henry Newbolt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapters forty to forty two. Chapter forty How Ewan came to Alador. Then Ewan went forth again from the gateway, and he came to the edge of the high steep to the place wherein the children had their pastime and there under the trees he began to go to and fro for he was restless by reason of the song that was yet in his ears and as he went to and fro the song continued with him and it worked as it were an enchantment in his blood for he kept looking upon alador that lay there under the sky border beyond the shepherdine sands and he saw it in a light that was no light of earth and he knew no longer where he might be but the world was lost and vanished from him and his feet ceased from going and he stood at gaze looking only upon that land of his desire now at the first it was far off from him but afterwards he beheld it near and clear past telling for it seemed to him that power came upon him whereby he had a vision of things not to be seen with eyes and for the land he saw that it was in all ways like to the land whereon he stood and in like shape it lay beside the sea margent and in like manner it rose up in a high steep green and grey and set with tall trees and shadowy and for the city that also was of no strange semblance for it was in fashion the very image and counterpart of palador and it was compassed with like walls and towers and with like gardens and streets enriched and diapered but by imagination ywain beheld the place otherwise for in his vision he perceived it as a city of peace and one that knew neither strife nor evil custom nor men of wood nor men of wildfire but only young lovers and old friends and folk of free and gentle dealing and besides these there were none other save only fays and phantoms and ywain knew that it was in all things such a city as seeing it he would have loved it in his youth and his life days seemed to him but wasted until he should enter and dwell therein and therewith his spirit rose within him and cried after that land with utter longing for his memory and his hope were become one and he knew not how to endure them then he started suddenly out of his vision and went down the high steep like a rolling stone and he came quickly with great bounds to the margent of the sea and when he came there he was aware of a little ship that lay upon the water and it was made fast to the shore with a black rope and a white and in it was a mast and a sail and the sail was party black and white and ywain stayed not there but leapt aboard and hoised up the sail and he took the hermit's knife from his breast and cut through the ropes both the black and the white for they were knotted strongly upon a ring of iron then he took the tiller into his hand and the ship began to go swiftly from the shore and he looked towards alador and saw it fair before him but how he should come there he knew not for he must come first into that white and tumbling water of the shepherdine sands right so he came flying amidst the sands and entered into the quick of them and the ship staggered and went suddenly from under him and he fell down and down to the bottom of the sea and he fell flatling and sprang up again and leapt upon his feet and as he looked upward and beheld the sea as it were above his head all white and seething and he perceived how it was in truth no sea but mist and belike it was a mist of fairy for it rolled and swirled above him in all semblance like to the sea but there was in it neither death nor darkness then he went forward under the mist and as he went it broke and was made thin before him and he saw green grass beneath his feet and over against him a mount of grey and green 
and he knew that he was come unto the high steep of Alador, and he saw it with no amazement, but with gladness only, for it was with him as with a man that has been long voyaging, and is returning at last into his own country. And he loved the land, and greeted it in his heart, and he found the path, and climbed upon it, and came quickly to the topmost of the steep and as he went climbing he heard again the song that before was in his ears and at the first he knew not whether he heard it within him or without then he saw above him the walls of the city and the gates therein and before the gates were children playing and the children were the same children and their pastime was the same pastime for they stood a line in two lines and sang together after the former fashion and the words of their songs were these you shall find dreams in Alador, all that ever were known, and you shall dream in Alador the dreams that were your own. Then, when he heard those words, he assented thereto, and he laughed in his heart, and so passed on. For they seemed to him nothing new, but he heard them as it were out of childhood and sweet memory. And he entered by the gateway, and came singing into the city and the streets of it were cool and shining like pale gold for they were all agleam with a light mist of sunrise chapter forty one how ewan entered into the rhymer's heritage and how he found his lady therein now as ewan went into the city he went joyfully for his heart was uplifted and his thoughts were like high white clouds in a blue sky of summer and most of all he joyed to see the beauty of the place for the form of it was the form of palador but the beauty was mingled of likeness and unlikeness and wherever he looked there he saw that which he remembered and there also he saw that which he remembered not so that his joy was both old and new and when he had gone but a score of paces into the city he came to the court that lay before the great guard and in the entrance of it he stayed and there passed by him two or three which went not in and he asked them whose was the castle for he perceived that there was a change upon it and they answered him that it was no castle but the rhymer's hall for that by the rhymer it was long since founded and upbuilt and when they had so answered they vanished from him suddenly and were gone as though they had never been then he was astonished and pondered a little looking within the court and in the court he saw not the halberdiers and men a horseback which had been there aforetime but upon the steps of the castle he saw a five or six minstrels with their lutes and anon they sang and anon they talked together and by seeming their talk was all only upon their lutes and upon their singing then ewan came to them and greeted them and said how long is this become a place of singing and one of them answered him courteously and said fair lord by your will we sing and by your will we are silent seeing that we are but the servants of your dream and even as ewan heard those words the minstrels vanished and there was nothing of them left in that place save a little sound of lute-strings that lingered waywardly so ewan entered into the rhymer's hall and within door he found the porter, and the man sat there reading upon a book. And Ewan asked him, What read you? And immediately the porter vanished without answer given, and there was naught seen of him but his chair, and upon the chair was the book whereon he had been reading. Then Ewan came near, and took up the book, and looked within it, and it was a wide book, painted delicately with great letters and with pictures, and the picture that was open before him was the picture of two lovers by a garden door and the lady stood beside the door and leaned upon it with her hand to open it but the lover came to her in habit of a pilgrim and his hat was broad above his face and shadowed it and ewan's heart quickened as he looked for the lady was his own lady and she stood there as living as the leaves in spring then he laid the book upon the chair and left it lying and he went through the rhymer's hall from end to end and through all the courts of it and out beyond and he came by a pleached alley to a close and looked across the close and upon the far side of it was a wall of stone 
and in the wall was a carven doorway and a door of wood and there before the doorway stood enya in the morning gold and she laid her hand against the door and looked a little downward as one that is waiting and musing and when ewan came to her she spoke no word but she turned away and led him through the doorway and the door fell back and closed behind them and it closed full slowly but at the last there was a small noise of clanking and the bar went home into the notch and that noise was sweet in ewan's ears for it seemed to shut the world away and he went to his lady as one that comes to his own land after long captivity and little they spoke in words but they looked each at each other and his eyes were to her like two bright spears levelled in battle and her eyes were to him like a valley at evening when the smoke goes up into the twilight then at the last he said to her what then is this place and she said it was the rhymer's heritage and now it is mine and that which is mine is yours for you have found it out and taken it and belike it was yours from the beginning for it is you that have made it anew and you are the master of your dream and as she spoke those words a fear came suddenly upon him lest she should also vanish and be gone from him and he would have cried aloud of his fear but she laid her hand upon his mouth and laughed and stayed him from uttering and she said i know your thought and vain it is for your dream and mine are one and not two as they were aforetime but each in other we have our home and our abiding chapter forty two how ewan and enya were given each to other and how they were wedded by the freedom of alador then ewan stood still and amused looking down upon the grass about his feet and he mused upon his pilgrimage whereby he had at last come hither and enya asked him of his musing and he answered her not but he said tell me o my beloved when shall be the end of this my pilgrimage and she answered it is ended for the shrine is found and the lamp of the world is lit afresh but he asked her again by what token shall i have certainty of this and she said by a flame and by a gift for by those tokens is love confirmed of all lovers both of old and for ever then his blood beat and his throat trembled and he said yea beloved but it may yet be far to the hour of giving and she also trembled and said the hour of giving is the hour of starlight and between the sun setting and moon rising it will be here then ewan looked again upon the ground and he saw beside his feet the long morning shadows and he said it is far o my beloved and she said nay but have i not told you that all things here are yours for that you only are the master of the dream then with her hand she pointed to the shadows upon the grass and they were two shadows that were as one and they lay upon a wide and open space and ewan looked again upon them and was amazed for the shadows drew in apace and they went round him as the finger goes upon the dial save that they went a forty times more quickly and he asked of his lady what mean these shadows for they are gone from the west into the east and she answered him softly o oh, my lord see you not that you are master even of the sun in heaven and she looked stilly into his eyes and a little wind of evening blew cool upon him then she took him by the hand and led him within the house and she brought him to an upper room and to a window therein which looked upon the city and the window was wide open and without it was a gallery of stone and ewan held his lady's hand and went forward upon the gallery then he looked down and saw beneath him the courtyard full of folk and the place was filled with the thronging of them and the street beyond the gates was filled also and at first the folk were silent and shadowy and the twilight gathered thick upon them and ewan looked hard among them peering to see if by their faces he might know them and by one and by two he knew them and there were by seeming in that place the faces of all men and women that he had known in all his life days then pity came upon him in a moment and great pain for he saw them as folk lost and gone from him 
and he would have had them to be partakers in his joy and in that moment came a light of sunset into the sky and it glowed upon the faces of them that were before him and they cried all together and called him by his name giving him friendship and honour and ewan shut to his eyes for there was that which burned them hotly and when he looked forth again there was neither face nor form of any man but only a sound as of folk departing then ewan said to enya are there not also some within doors in this place that i may do them courtesy and she answered they too are of the bordure of your dream so she brought him within and they went towards the great hall and there went with them lights and trumpets and when they came to the hall they found there a great company of knights sitting at a feast together and the knights were in number a hundred and they were all they which in their time had sought the lady enya and her love and their feasting was full sombre and courteous and when they saw ewan and enya they rose up and did them reverence and they gathered about them and spoke many things of honour and of farewell then ewan gave them thanks with the like honour and immediately they faded from before him and with them the lights also faded and fell to darkness and in the hall was none left with ewan and enya save one child only and the child was nowise strange to them for it was he which had been the beginner of their pilgrimage and in his hand was a torch burning and he bore it up before them and about them the shadows went dancing upon the walls and upon the roof and he went down the hall and they too followed after him with hand in hand and so he brought them to the chamber where they should be wed and when they were come there he turned his torch downwards to quench it upon the floor and the flame of it vanished and the child therewith and the place was lit by starlight only but in the chamber was also a little glowing as of embers and ewan saw there an altar of bronze and it seemed to him right ancient as a thing made in the time out of mind and beside the altar was a platter of meal and a cup of red wine standing and enya took the meal in her hand and in like manner ewan took the wine and they too stood beside the altar on this side and on that and sprinkled it with meal and wine and there went up from it two bright flames of fire a red and a white and they spired up and were entwined together so that they were two colours but only one flame then ewan looked upon his beloved and said the flame is here truly but where is the gift and she also looked steadfastly upon him and answered him the gift is here but it is yours to show first the manner of the giving and thereat he took her by the hand and said here in free marriage i give thee the body of me my life with thy life my blood with thy blood my dust with thy dust to be mingled and made one then with a low voice she said after him the same words and he said again here also i give thee the heart of me my love with thy love my hope with thy hope my sorrow with thy sorrow to be mingled and made one and those words also she spoke in like manner then he said the third time here also do i witness that i have given thee long since the spirit of me to be thy friend and fellow to the end of pilgrimage yea she said and thereafter and with thee and with all the spirits to be mingled and made one then she said again as to herself only now i am wedded by the freedom of alador and so is my promise fulfilled and when she had said that she fell suddenly to weeping and she went to the window and leaned upon the sill and ewan came near and he saw her tears falling bright under the starlight and he was both sorry and afraid and he took her in his arms and asked her many times wherefore she wept and she told him not and at the last she said that will i tell you but not now and i weep not for sorrow but for remembrance then he solaced her with comfort of strength and of silence and afterwards they went joyfully to their wedding and to their rest and the moon rose on alador and they saw her not for they slept as it had been the sleep of childhood end of part fourteen
Part fifteen of Alador by Henry Newbolt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapters forty three to forty five. Chapter forty three. How Enya showed Ewan of the enchantments of the rhymer and of them which do thereafter. So in this wise Ewan and Enya fulfilled their youth, and they entered into newness of life and they endured no more the fear of time, for in Alador are days and seasons, but no count of them, and there is there neither change nor perishing. Now on a day it befell that they two stood together at dawn, looking upon the sea, and the sun rose out of the sea, and went swiftly up the sky. And Ewan looked upon the sea, and he saw it bright and clear, even to the farthest border, and there was neither land nor cloud upon it, but gold only, and a void space above the gold. And thereat he was astonished, and he asked of Enya, Where then is Palador? For I came thence by no long voyage. And she smiled a little, and answered him, Let be, dear love, for it is not far off, and as much thereof as was yours, so much is yours still, for so much you brought hither when you came, and this is the law of Alador, that in it hath every man his own and nothing less yea rather he hath more for unto his own vision are added many great enchantments then said ewan which be these enchantments and she answered they are the enchantments of the rhymer that was a wizard indeed and his magic he left to all such as are able for it unto the world's end and many there be of them then she took ewan up into a higher tower and so forth unto the battlements thereof, and she said, Look now, and behold the sorrows of Gudrun, for she loved much, and suffered many things, and her end was full of right piteous remembrance. And Ewan looked down from the battlements, and he saw a steep coast and a river which ran swiftly to a western sea, and there lay hard by the river a steading upon a knoll amidst the vale, and it nourished plenteously both sheep and kine and an old man he saw which dwelt therein, and five boys that were his sons, and one more that was his brother's son. And all they went among the cattle, and rode by hill and by dale. And Ewan looked further, by a seven mile, and he saw yet another steading, amidst the grey slopes, and there also was an old man dwelling, and five sons and a daughter thereto, and these men likewise went among the cattle, and rode by hill and by dale, and the maiden tended them within the hall. And Ewan saw how the folk would come and go between the steadings, and how in their dealing there would be love and strife among them. Then Enya asked of him, What see you? And he told her of that which he saw. And she said, Not so shall be your vision, for though by your deeming these are but country folk, and their land a little land and a barren, yet is your deeming vain, and their life is greater than you know. Look therefore again, and by enchantment shall your eyes be made clear to see them. Then Ewan looked again, and as he looked a voice was in his ears, and his heart-strings rung deeply thereto, for they were plucked and quivering as beneath the hand of a strong harper. And now he saw that land after another fashion, for he saw it as a strange and awful land, and the folk of it as a folk beset with fearful things, yet fearing naught, as men in the hollow of God's hand. And as folk, loving and beloved, he saw them, and strong and uncomplaining and compassionate, yet also working wild deeds after the manner of men. For he saw young Kiartan the Icelander, and Bodley that was his friend and fellow, and Gudrun that was beloved of them both, and the double skein of their love was tangled and broken in his sight. And first the voice showed him all the love of Kiartan and Gudrun, and how Kiartan came daily from Herdholt by moor and dale unto the house of Bathstead, wherein Gudrun dwelt, and how her heart fluttered joyfully at the hearing of his footfall, and long they talked together, and at evening departed hardly each from other, and their very parting was sweet, for in that moment the veil of time would fall away from before them, so that they saw love whole and without cloud. Then the voice bade Ewan to see the pride of Kiartan, whereby he went adventuring over sea, 
and he saw how Kiartan came across the foam to Norroway, and there lingered by the space of three good years, making pastime of another love, and that was the love of Ingibjorg, that was King Olaf's daughter. Yet at the last he left her also, and returned, howbeit he returned not till it was too late. And the voice showed Ewan all the sorrows of Bodli, Thorlake's son, for he was of all her lovers the man which most loved Gudrun. And Ewan saw him come alone from Norroway, with tidings of Kiartan and of Ingibjorg, and thereby he wedded Gudrun, and fulfilled his longing and his doom. Then Ewan's heart trembled with pity and with terror, for he saw how Kiartan came again after three years, and found Gudrun gone from him utterly, and given to his friend and upon Kiartan also came despair, as it had come before upon Gudrun, so that he turned him to Refna, and wedded where he had no heart's desire, and thereafter fell great bitterness between Herdholt and Bathstead, and though there was love still between Bodley and Kiartan, yet was their death also by the custom of men. For on a dark road among the hills came Kiartan, riding with two more, and there met him all the five brothers of Gudrun and Bodley with them. And Ewan saw how Kiartan fought strongly with Gudrun's kin, and Bodley stood apart. Yet at the last he might not forsake the men of his own house, and he drew near the fighting, and thrust his sword into the side of Kiartan, whom he loved. And Ewan knew that he had slain therewith his own soul also. Then said the voice to Ewan, that he should look once more upon Gudrun, for that she lived long afterwards when the rest were gone their way. And Ewan saw her as an old and sightless dame, and she sat within her bower at evening, and it was summer with hay in the field, and the carles sang as they went homeward, and the sea murmured below, and above was a chapel on the hill, with bells which rang therein. And Gudrun sat there with her son, that was the son of Bodley. And he asked her, of those whom she had loved, which was most loved. And she told him in no plain words, but in a dark and sorrowful saying. For she that was blind and old saw again her halt and her youth, and the deeds that she had done therein. Then the voice ceased, and the vision, and Ewan looked upon Enya, and he would have spoken, but he could not, for his voice was choked within his throat, and she smiled tenderly upon him, as one that has understanding of pain, and therewith she gave her hand into his hand. And presently he spoke and said, What is this place, and whose is the voice which I heard? And she said, It is the Rhymer's Tower, and the voice is the voice of one which had the Rhymer's magic, for there are here many voices, and all to your solace, and by them is the world remade after the fashion of life enduring. Chapter 44 How Ewan beheld his lady sleeping, and how he desired to see the castle of Kerioch. So Ewan dwelt in a land of enchantments, and had his will thereof continually, and many things he devised for his joyance, and one thing beyond all other, for it befell him on a day that he awoke at dawn, and thereafter came the sunrise, and made light the chamber where he was. And he turned him, and looked upon Enya, thereas she lay still sleeping. And her face was fresh, and clear, and tranquil, as the face of a little maid in her flower of youth. And as Ewan looked upon her, his heart was pricked through with a sudden pain, for he saw her as she had been aforetime, in the days when she was no lady of his. And the pain was sharp, for well nigh he forgot that which he knew of her, and thought only on that which he knew not, and he perceived that he could never come thereto, except he should go behind the back of time. Then Enya awoke, and saw him looking down upon her, and she said, O oh, my beloved, why look you so darkly upon me? And he said, Great things have you given me, and great enchantments have you showed me, but one thing I lack that you have held from me. Then she asked of him, What have I held from you? or what will you ask of me that I will not give you presently? And he was glad of that word, and made request of her, saying, I beseech you that you bring me into the castle of Kerioch 
wherein you were born and nurtured for except i see the manner of your youth therein i am not wholly mingled with your life and when she heard him she laughed and loved him in her heart for that which he asked was pleasing to her and she said to him go now and have your will for your request is granted you and you shall go by the way of yesterday and enter into the garden close and come thence into the place beyond and you shall stand therein looking upon the ground and speaking no word save one word that is your name and that you shall say aloud by a hundred times and one so prove your adventure and come again to me for until you come i am alone then ewan kissed her thrice and went out and he went by the way of the garden close and came to the place beyond and he stood and looked downward upon the ground and spoke his own name aloud and when he had spoken it but a score of times then his name was his name no longer but a sound without sense and void and he knew that the place was changed wherein he stood and he looked up and saw the sea hard by him and by the sea was a castle both great and ancient and he went forward boldly and entered into the castle without help or hindrance then he went spying out all things within the castle and he found it rich and well beseen and folk there were therein but they took no heed of him no more than if he had not been and at the last he heard a voice singing and coming towards him and presently there came to him a little maid and she left singing and looked curiously upon him as one that knew him not then his heart was buffeted within him for she was the maid which he sought but he perceived that she had of him neither love nor knowledge and he said to her of a surety you are enya but where is she which is my lady in Alidore? and the child looked upon him with clear eyes and she answered him in a little voice and sweet sir stranger you come hither too late for long ago she is grown up and gone away then fear came upon him and he longed to be with his own again and he woke as from a vain dream and stood in his chamber whence he had gone forth and before him was his lady in her own image and her kisses were still upon his lips and she lay looking upon him in the sunlight and her eyes were filled with love and with laughter chapter forty five how ewan found again him which was forgotten in alador and how he heard a ring of bells at midnight thereafter came ewan many times into the castle of kerioc and enya with him for she loved greatly to have him there notwithstanding that she had a good game at him when he went thither the first time and in especial she would have him there in winter at the time of yule for that castle stands by the very margent of the sea upon a high rock and it is in fashion like to an island for on the one side it is set high above the land and on the other side it goes down steeply toward the shore and the wind of winter goes over it from the land seaward and on the shore is warm lying among the sand-hills which are beneath the castle and above the sand-hills is a postern gate and steps of stone and thereby came ewan and enya many times on to the shore at midnight that they might see the stars and hear the crying of the birds for the sea-birds cry about that place with a sweet cry and a sad and in the darkness they draw near and are not seen as it were the souls of the beloved so after this wise ewan and enya came and went and they took of all seasons such days as they would and lived carelessly for they were as those which have more than they can spend and after certain times it was so with ewan that he remembered no longer the days when he knew not kerioc for his life was changed and deepened as a river is deepened when twain flow together in one and he desired no more save that he might always so continue for he forgot that the road of his pilgrimage was not yet passed beyond the gateway of death yet at the last he remembered it perforce for upon a day he wandered alone in the castle of kerioc and by chance he came into a crypt that was thereunder and in the crypt he spied a door which was well locked and made fast so that he could not open it then he came to enya and said what is this door whereof you gave me not the key 
for all other keys she had given him save this one only and she denied not but answered him plainly and she counselled him that he should forbear that door but when she saw that he would not forbear then she gave him the key and she said to him go now and take your way for it is a man's way and it may be that your heart shall be stronger than your head to serve you and if not then must i endure it for i knew long since how this should be and ewan perceived how she spoke to him and she spoke with love and mirth and in the mirth was a little sorrow but he put by the sorrow and took hold on the mirth and so kissed her and went his way and he came to the door and opened it and within were bare chambers of rock in manner of dungeons and in one chamber he perceived a dim light and when he was come there he saw a lamp of bronze hanging and beneath it an old man on a chair of black stone and his beard was long and white and it fell over his knees as a stream falls over a mountain side and when he saw him ewan trembled for his heart misgave him who the old man should be then ewan said to him sir forgive me for i came hither unknowing and the old man answered him my son this long time that you have been in aladore you do all things unknowing and ewan said thereto yet my life i know and my own gladness for this a man cannot but know and it suffices me then the old man looked hard upon ewan and his eyes were like grey stones and the weight of them sank into ewan's eyes and lay heavy upon his heart and he said to ewan you speak also unknowing for alador is no substance of truth but all is dream and this for you is keriok and the seventh winter that you are herein that all is dream for since you forgot palador it is not yet seven days and as for keriok it is there where it was aforetime beside the forest of Brasseliond. then ewan hardened his heart and he said to the old man sir i have heard your saying and i understand it not for i am here and in my right mind and therein is the substance of truth for every man and the old man said not so but you shall awake and know your dream and i will give you a token and the token shall be when you shall hear the bells of palador ringing midnight in your ears then was ewan angered against the old man for he feared his saying and he left him suddenly and went out and locked the door fiercely upon him and he came to enya and said no word and she perceived how he was lost in trouble then she spoke gently to him tell me your thought for i perceive that you have found again him that was forgotten then ewan told her of the old man and of his great beard and of his eyes and of his evil saying and he told her with many words for he was angry and afraid and she also was afraid for she had seen that old man aforetime and found no force against him but now she took her lute and made a song of him and when he heard the song then was ewan brought again into his former mind as for that time but enya doubted within herself then within a while the day drew in and the sun set on keriok and all the lands of alador and ewan and enya laid them to their rest and enya slept deep and stirred not but ewan awoke suddenly and he found darkness on all things and no light at all for moon there was none and the stars were hid in mist and for a while he lay still and moved not but his mind moved continually and it led him hither and thither until he was perplexed and weary and in an evil moment he thought on that old man which he had seen and instantly he heard a sound of bells and he knew that they were the bells of palador for they were sounding midnight then he started up in fear and went softly out of the chamber for he said within himself that he would walk upon the shore and come again and so ease him of his thought so he came to the postern and opened it and went down upon the sand hills and he wandered to and fro thereon without respect of mind or body and at the last he was fordone with weariness and set him down to rest and right so he fell to forgetfulness and sleep and when he awoke the second time it was grey dawn and the mist was still upon the sea 
and he turned him about and looked up that he might see the castle of Kerioc, and he saw neither shape nor sign of it nor any way of his returning but he saw instead a high steep grey and green and walls and towers thereon then the mist began to depart from before his eyes and he knew the place as a man knows again the face which he had forgotten and his heart failed within him and the sun rose on palador end of part fifteen part sixteen of alador by henry newbolt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapters forty six to forty eight chapter forty six how ewan was counselled of the prince of palador then ewan came to the height of the steep and there before the gate he stood in doubt for he knew not whither he should go and in his doubt his feet drew him unwittingly and he looked up suddenly and saw the great guard and the courtyard which was before it and the courtyard was as it had been aforetime with halberdiers before the door and men a horseback in their armour and the rhymer's hall and the minstrels and all his dealings therein seemed but an old vision of a show which had passed into memory notwithstanding he doubted even of his misery for he said within himself surely this also is a dream and there beyond the garden close is my lady waiting until i come to her then he went towards the door and one came thereout to meet him and ewan perceived that it was sir reynold and he would have passed by with such courtesy as might suffice but sir reynold stayed him and took him by the hand and he said to ewan how that it was even he whom he sought and none other for the prince would speak with him of certain matters and of these matters he said i will tell you this much by way of friendship and namely that the prince which is your master and liege takes it ill that he is so deceived in you for you gave him assurance that you would dwell in palador and do after the customs of the city but now you deal otherwise and are gone continually from hence and none knows whither then ewan was perplexed and knew not what he should answer for he remembered how that it was forbidden in that city to speak the name of Alador. Also he remembered the saying of the hermit, that he must return to Palador and find his life among men, and so come to the land of his desire. And Sir Reynold kept watch upon him slyly out of the side of his eye, and he saw his perplexity, and in part he knew the reason of it. And he said to Ewan, Go now, and follow the counsel of a friend, and say what you will unto the prince, save only that you say not anything which is outrageous against our custom for even to utter such a word before a prince is ungentle seeing that he is not bred to hear villainy and hath no skill to answer thereto so ewan went from him and came presently before the prince and the prince was counting his money for he was a careful man and every month he counted his money from one great chest into another and at the first he looked upon ewan and gave him no greeting but afterwards when he had made an end of his counting then he spoke to him and he said as sir reynold had reported him how that he was deceived in ewan for he had looked to have him dwelling continually in palador to fight and to do adventures and not to go wandering otherwhere then ewan answered him courteously and said sir i have done with my wandering and except it be in palador I have no place of dwelling as in this world and when he had said that the prince looked shrewdly upon him as one that would pierce a covered thing and he asked of ewan whither then go you and whence came you now for you have been seven days in hiding since that you were seen within the city and ewan answered sir it is hard to tell for i have been in no place of the world but in a land of dreams ha said the prince i knew it well for it is a common case and an evil and i will deal patiently with you in this matter seeing that you are an outlander born and not yet perfect in the custom of our city know then that in palador a dream is a thing of naught and a byword of folly for we are lovers of truth and in dreams there is no truth at all and we approve all such things as have substance and gold the chief and sign of all 
and thereby is the repute of them which are great among us for to do and to have is the virtue of men but they which dream do nothing and gain no pennyworth and ewan could well hear that which was said for it was clearly spoken but in the same moment he heard also his lady's voice and remembered him of her sweet fellowship and his heart grew hot and his eyes were lightened and the prince faded suddenly from before him and the gold was turned to sunshine within the chest and ewan turned him about toward the doorway and he saw there enya in the beauty of morning and she smiled and said to him beloved why went you from me for i dreamed evilly of bells at midnight and i awoke and found you not chapter forty seven how ewan and enya had sight of hubert and returned together into palador now was ewan again in alador and accompanied with his love and for a while he forgot the prince and all his counsel and went among diverse delights as a honey-bee goes among a wilderness of flowers and it befell on a night that he sat with enya beside a fountain and in the pool of the fountain they looked upon the summer stars and round about them were cypresses and shadows and there was no wind in the hollow of the night nor any sound save a little silvery sound of the fountain and enya spoke softly to ewan in the dark and she said to him beloved tell me of many things for the night is still and secret and this fountain shall be your fountain of memory and he asked her for asking's sake of which thing first shall i tell you and she answered of your life in palador and of those with whom you had your dealing whether in love or in hate for some of them i also have known and some never and they shall be to me like them which are in a tale of fairy or a picture woven upon the wall then ewan leaned over and looked into the pool of the fountain and he remembered the saying of the hermit how that in all still water there will be visions and true it was aforetime and true now and in this water ewan saw both palador and all that he had done therein and the faces of his friends he saw and of his enemies and he saw his own face and form among them and he perceived all their love and their evil malice and that which he saw he told it to enya as a tale out of live memory for it was there before his eyes in clear colours and he told her of those four which had been friends to him in palador and namely of morris which had a merry wit and of dennis whose sayings bit like salt also of bartholomew the religious and of hubert that first of all named alador to ewan by name and ewan made a more especial mention of hubert because that he was such an one as would give the world for a dream and ever as he rehearsed of hubert ewan saw his face more clear before him and when he had come to an end of his tale then he saw him yet more clear and ewan fell silent and bent him down above the water for he remembered the well of the hermit and he thought to see not only that which had befallen but also somewhat of that which should befall but enya knew his thought and said to him look no more for this is the fountain of memory and though the memory be not ours but greater yet in it are shown no deeds save those which are accomplished notwithstanding ewan continued looking and as he looked he cried out in anger for he saw in the vision sir reynold and how he came with certain of his and laid hold on hubert and they led hubert away by force and so passed as it were out of the pool into the dimness of the night then ewan started up and told enya of that which he had seen and she said you do well to cry out how be it you cry too late for that which you saw is surely done already but ewan stood staring into the darkness for it seemed to him that he heard a going among the cypresses and as he stood there staring and enya with him there came one walking toward them in the thickest of the shadows and when he was come nearer he lift up his face and looked steadfastly at them and so passed by and was gone from them again and enya said to ewan tell me quickly whose face was that which i saw and ewan drew in his breath and answered her it was the face of hubert and though he spoke no word yet with his eyes he called me yea said enya 
and methought he called us both for he looked upon me also and in his look was strong sorrow and entreaty then pity and anger went over ywain like a river in flood and he said to his lady what must i do for i have need of your help and your enchantments then enya answered him not but she took him by the hand and brought him to the margent of the fountain and they held firmly each by other and so stepped together into the pool and ywain felt the water cold about his knees and he shivered and awoke as it were from a sleep and the fountain and the cypresses were vanished from him and he stood with enya upon a beach of the sea and before them was a high steep shining with grey and with green and above it was a grey and silver cloud and a crescent moon and the moon rose over palador chapter forty eight how ywain was awearied of palador and how he was mishandled by the great ones of the city then they climbed the steep together and entered into the city and ywain brought enya home to his own house and he made her a little supper scant enough and drew wine for her of the wine which the eagles had given him and sweet it was still but the spirit was gone out of it and when they had eaten and drunk then a great weariness came upon ywain and he spoke and uttered his complaint unto enya for he was adread to hear ill tidings of hubert and in his heart he sighed after the peace of Alador. and his lady comforted him and said beloved think not to be alone in weariness for to me also the business of palador hath been as dust upon the tongue but this is the fortune of men to dwell in two realms until that our life is changed and it may be that the time is not long and what matter if by our own magic we may come and go and what grief if we may be together so ywain was comforted by means of those words for they were more than wine to him and the chime told midnight and they twain laid them to their sleep and in the morning before men were stirring ywain ran quickly to the house of hubert and knocked upon the door and there came to him morris and dennis and told him ill tidings of hubert how that he had been thrust forth out of the city never to return under pain of life and they told him further how that the eagles were sworn to bring him in again for he had done no wrong but only to speak against them of the tower and ywain had great indignation thereat and swore instantly to be of their fellowship but inwardly he groaned to be so bound again for he saw no end to strife and no day of returning notwithstanding he stooped him to his burden and shouldered it and he went here and there throughout the city and spoke among divers sorts of men and in general he found them to be of three sorts and namely there were some of good will toward the eagles and some which held by the tower for favour's sake and yet more there were which were men of ease and loved nothing so much as to keep order and custom and to hear no questions and these said to ywain that they were neither of this side nor of that but would favour no man that should be a disturber of peace then came one to ywain and stayed him in the midst of the street and he was a summoner and by his office he summoned ywain to come before the archbishop so ywain went with him and as he went he marvelled within himself what manner of turn was this for he had had no dealings with clergy neither for them neither against and when he came to the palace then he was yet more astonished for the archbishop sat in no public place but in a little chamber set about with books and with him were three or four great ones of the company of the tower and they greeted ywain courteously and asked him to speak his mind unto them concerning hubert then ywain took the word and reasoned with them that it was no good cause to banish a man if he should have spoken against a company or against a custom and when he had said that he looked to be down cried and angrily used howbeit the game was otherwise played as at this time for none cried out nor used him angrily but they of the tower made a show to receive his saying courteously and to agree thereto then the archbishop spoke to ywain and his eyes glowed like coals and his voice was rich and sweet like strong wine softened with honey and he said 
these are my friends and yours and they would be friends to hubert also for there is no malice in them but good will and free forgiveness but hubert would not to my grief i say it for he was taken with an ill mind and brought disease upon many and his disease was this that he became a dreamer of dreams and would have others to be like himself and thereby they were in danger to have perished then said ewan my lord i pray you pardon me of what dreams do men perish and the archbishop answered him patiently and said surely of all such dreams as are not according to faith then said ewan i rejoice to hear my lord saying for hubert is of all men most full of faith as one that would give the world for a dream and even as he does so do i and mine for we long after our own land and go pilgrimage to find it and in that it is a land of dream it is a land of faith for by our dreams we make life new and ever during and what else do all the men of faith and when he said that the archbishop was some deal choked in his throat and the red blood came into his face about his eyes and he said to ewan what mean you sir for i fear lest i should understand your saying and ewan answered let me use plain words with reverence for we are both of us men and the sons of men and to each man his own magic and we all seek for the land of our desire and we build therein a city and a house for our abiding and you call your city paradise and ours we call alador for of our own dreams it is builded and upheld then the archbishop rose up upon his feet and he looked on ewan with a stern countenance and said it is enough and he went out in his wrath and the great ones followed after him end of part sixteen Part seventeen of Alador by Henry Newbolt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapters forty nine to fifty one. Chapter forty nine. How Ewan was excommunicate after the custom of Palador. Little enough thought Ewan of the anger of those great ones, for he held himself to have outreasoned them, and he perceived not how by his cunning the archbishop had entrapped him before witnesses of repute but enya perceived it and more for ewan told her some deal and other deal she divined of herself and when she had considered a little she bade him make haste and do those things for which he came and look not to be long unharassed of his enemies for that they had fastened an ill quarrel upon him by no chance but by intent and they were such as would follow their craft so he went about the town busily seeking out all those which were friends to hubert and all those which were haters of evil custom and he found some and persuaded other and thought to have made good way and this time also he perceived how he was favoured of the commons of palador for he discoursed to them hotly and they were ever assotted on discourse and a burning tongue and on a day he came down to the door of his house to go forth into the city and there came to his ears a sound of a bell tolling and of a multitude of people going all one way and he hastened and came to the end of the street and found them passing by for they were going toward the market-place and he perceived that in the middle was a train of some sort walking by two and by two and there went a great bell before them and beside them the multitude ran and jostled under the walls of the street and ewan joined himself to them for he was willing to know of their dealing and for the thickness of the crowd he could not see what was to the forward but only he perceived that in the train were many great ones of the company of the tower then he spoke to a man that was beside him in the crowd and he asked of him what might be the meaning of the concourse and of the tolling for the bell was of a right dolorous sound but among the people was no sadness at all and the man answered him well you may ask as i also have asked but a moment since for the like of this hath not happed within my memory and the concourse is all to see and to hear the archbishop a cursing and the bell also is part of the cursing 
for it betokens that he which is cursed should be as it were buried out of sight and fellowship then ewan remembered hubert and his heart rose and he asked again whom then will they curse and for what cause and the man answered he is one ewan and i know him well and the cause is a true cause for he is a blasphemer of the faith a dealer in dreamage and all manner of sorceries and at that saying ewan was astonished and said no more for he had thought to hear speak of hubert and not of himself and he went forward strongly through the press and came out into the market-place and stood upon a step under an archway and looked forth over the heads of the multitude and he saw the train there before him and in the forefront were an hundred of the company of the tower wearing their livery of black with a golden tower thereon and after them came an hundred of clergy apparelled in black clothes and white and an hundred doctors of the schools with gowns of diverse colours and the archbishop was robed in a silken robe of crimson with a great hat of the same and before him went two with candles in hand and one with a bell so they came upon the place in seemly order and they halted there and departed into two lines the one over against the other and the archbishop passed through and stood upon the steps of the great hall and he held up his hand and immediately the bell ceased from tolling and they of the multitude were hushed from their babble then came seven clergy before the archbishop having seven great candles in their hands and they stood and set light to them and held them aloft and when all the people had perceived their dealing then they threw down the candles upon the ground and trod out the flame of them and as they trod them they cried against them out out accursed until all were quenched then the archbishop stood forth with staff in hand and he bade all men to know and to make known how that ewan was thenceforth cut off from the company of all men living and from the company of all the faithful dead and under pain of the like sentence he ordained that none should give him neither shelter nor speech nor food nor fellowship nor any means of life nor burial after death and when he had so said he went solemnly out from the place and all his train followed after him and last of all went he that had the bell a tolling dolorously chapter fifty how ewan and enya came to alador the last time as in this transitory life now ewan was known of none for he was in a sure place and looked forth above the heads of the multitude but he perceived all that was done and none better and he understood right well the evil malice and craft of his enemies and his heart was pricked therewith as with the poison of wasps and the tolling of the bell he regarded not neither the treading of the candles for he held such things to be shows to frighten fools but the curses and the sentences and all the words of the archbishop those stung his blood and made bitterness in his throat then he thought to get some comfort of the people which were round about him and he went forward a little and mingled with them and heard their talk and at the first he had some pleasure of them for there was not one in twenty but was making merry with no saving of reverence no not of the archbishop himself but therewith came displeasure that he also was but lightly accounted of for the most part of the crowd made no distinction but they cheapened the sin with the punishment and the best that he could find was this that the young and lean men were for him and the old and fat against him for in palador the old dream not save it be of gold and gluttony and with this he was but ill content for they which are young in that city are no more than one in three and they are of small account seeing that the best of them are banished so he left that and came away covertly to his own house and he found enya therein and told her of all he had seen and heard and of the pain which he had in his heart of this he told her not but she perceived it by the manner of his speaking for she knew his thought as it were by touch and not by words and she said to him it is no marvel if you are in pain for there is no venom in nature like to the venom of speech and many times it will work madness in the blood 
but there is good magic against it as i shall show you presently for this is a woman's gift from the time out of mind and bethink you also how their curses are no better than their ceremonies and both alike fully for they are but tokens and have in them no power to make good nay said ewan but they have this power that they hurt where they are aimed for in another man's case i had never regarded them but when they struck my own name then they pierced and rankled and thereat he cast down his eyes and fell into a weariness and enya came to him and stood beside him where he sat and she took his head between her arms and drew it in upon her breast and immediately the bands of his weariness were loosed and his spirit was rocked in a sure hold as a young child is rocked by his mother and he shut to his eyes and remembered no more the things which were done against his peace then he opened his eyes again and he saw how that he stood in a meadow of flowers and the flowers were king cups and lady smocks and other such as are chiefly loved of children and among the flowers there ran a little brook and in the brook were minnows going all one way like boats upon a wind and it seemed to ewan that it were worth all other joys if he might take but one minnow in his naked hand and not far off from him stood a little maid and called to him and she called him to come home for it was time and he knew that she was his sister that was his elder by two years and it was in his mind to obey her but not yet then he stretched out his hand and stooped forward above the brook and he snatched suddenly at a minnow that was there and the sedge yielded beneath him and he fell with his arms upon the water and immediately he came to his feet again and stood upon the meadow but he was all bedabbled and bedrenched and he feared to be chidden and his fear burst forth from him and he wept then the maid that was his sister came to him and stood beside him and took his head between her arms and drew it in upon her breast and he shut to his eyes and immediately his fear was stayed and the water was dried upon his arms and upon his feet and his heart was comforted and he opened his eyes again and looked about him and he saw the place wherein he was and the place was changed and was become alador and he sat by the margent of the sea where he had been aforetime and enya was there beside him to his solace and he said to her o my beloved what enchantment is this that you have used for i have been a child again and in great grief concerning little things and i have been comforted with the comfort of my mother and of my sister which are long since dead and gone from me and enya stooped over him and kissed him and said even so beloved and this enchantment is no marvel seeing that it is common with them which are lovers of men for it is the gift of a woman and an heritage from the time that is out of mind chapter fifty one of two cities that were builded diversely and how ewan and enya heard a horn blown over sea for battle then said ewan doubtless your saying is true and well have i proved the gift yet i marvel notwithstanding for a man may wonder in despite of knowledge and there is one matter concerning which i am still perplexed and enya said to him say on and he said to her i am perplexed between two verities for there is one truth of palador and another of alador and though they be diverse yet they both have by seeming the nature of truth veritable and many times my mind is in doubt concerning them for in our life that now is we come and go between two realms and i would that i might know which of them shall outdure other and enya asked him after what manner seem these verities to you and he answered o oh, beloved now am i with you in alador and all things else and all men and all places are but as shadows cast by this our life and we move them as we will and as we will we take away their being but when i am alone and dwelling yonder among men then have those shadows truth of substance and of touch and the life of alador becomes an image in the mind as it was aforetime when i saw it as a cloud in heaven then enya was silent a space and fear came into her eyes and afterwards she spoke suddenly and said o oh, my beloved 
keep innocency for to a child these things are plain and you were a child this moment past and i with you and wherefore now should we cloud our wisdom with a doubt and she rose up and said to him let us play a game together as children that play upon the shore for here is sand enough and loneliness and the tide returning and we will build us two cities and see which of the two shall best endure and you shall build your city with your hands and name it palador and you shall make it in all things like to the city that you know with a high steep seaward and a wall and a gateway and towers thereon and i also will make a city and name it alador and i will make it after the same fashion but not of the same substance for i will not build it with hands but with a power of the spirit so ywain took of the wet sand and of the dry and he built him a great mound after the manner of children and when he had made it strong then he carved it into the likeness of a city with a high steep and a wall and towers thereon and it stood upon the shore and looked out seaward and he named it palador for it was fashioned in no other wise and the tide came running toward the edges of the steep then ywain said to enya this is my city o my playfellow and i marvel that yours is not yet a building but enya answered him not for she was singing a song of witchery and she sang in a low voice and sweet and as she sang she weaved a witch-knot upon the air with both her hands and immediately there came a little mist upon the shore and the mist drew upward from the sand and hung in one place upon the air like smoke and so it continued the while enya sang her song and when she had ceased from her singing then ywain saw the mist no more for it was clean vanished and in the place thereof was another mound and another city in semblance like unto the first and those two cities were nigh together upon the shore and the tide came about them both by little and little and ywain and enya stood still and looked upon the tide and it came running and lapping more fiercely and the froth of it began to foam upon the edges of the mounds and the water gnawed upon the sand of the one city and that was ewan's and the walls and towers of it began to crumble and to crack and at the last they were perished wholly as by ruin of time and the tide flowed over them and they were gone but with enya's city it was not so for the sea bit not upon it nor overflowed it but it stood above the water until the turning of the tide and ywain came near to touch it but he could not for it was but mist between his fingers and he left it alone and stood and looked upon it again and it endured as rock notwithstanding it was builded of a song then he said to enya the game is naught for you have played it by no fair hazard but by enchantment and she answered him not so for by this same enchantment is alador upbuilded and sustained and that is the truth of it and she looked into his eyes and her spirit entered into him and they twain were one spirit and the dusk began to fall about them and peace therewith for they were in their own place beyond time and tide but in that moment came change upon ywain for a sound was in his ears and the sound was the sound of a horn blown over sea and in the hearing of it all the blood of his body leapt furiously up to battle End of part seventeen. Part eighteen of Alador by Henry Newbolt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapters fifty two to fifty four. Chapter fifty two of a ship that was full of ladies and lovely knights, and how Ewan and Enya departed with them over sea then ywain looked upon enya and in one moment he remembered all her love and her kindness and pain was mingled with his joy and his heart was filled with a tumult past bearing and he groaned aloud and cried ah my beloved what is this that has come upon us for here is the land of our desire and the land of all loveliness and all delectable enchantments and herein we might have had life enduring but now i see well that there is no such fortune for the horn has sounded and the sound of it has power upon body and blood 
and peace is gone from me suddenly and i can by no means keep me from the fight for the cause is a right cause and one that must be ransomed yea though all else be given and lost for it but enya regarded him out of the depth of her eyes and she said grieve not dear heart for how shall that which is given be lost and as for the life which dureth that is of the spirit and not of the body for consider them which were great lovers of old time how that they are all perished as in the world transitory yet their souls dwell not in death nor forgetfulness and when he heard those words ewan's heart was made strong again and his eyes were lightened and he saw his life as it were a tale that shall be told and he turned him about suddenly for he was aware how there came somewhat from the seaward and that which came was a ship going slowly under stress of oars and ewan perceived that the ship was builded after the fashion of old time and her sails were furled upon the yards and she came by her oarage landward against the wind and upon her deck stood many goodly persons and they were all in silk or else in armour richly beseen and they bore them gently and with a joyful courage then ewan was astonished and he asked of enya who be these for i know them not yet their faces are like faces out of childhood and enya answered him you say not amiss for these are they which are known of all men howbeit none hath seen them that is now on live for yonder by the prow is helen fairest of women and paris by whom troy fell and there is great achilles that was loved both of maid and of man and prince troilus that had double sorrow in loving of Criseida, and duke jason that won the fleece perilous and medea that for his sake forsook her father's house and hard by them is sigurd of the volsungs and brynhild the queen for whom he rode the wavering fire notwithstanding they came never together but they were proud lovers until death and other two queens there are beside brynhild and they are isud and guinevere and with isud haunteth sir tristram which drank with her the cup of sorrow and with the lady guinevere is that sir lancelot that was never matched of earthly knight's hand then ewan looked and he saw all those which were named and other beside and his heart was stirred with the sadness and the glory of them and he asked again of enya tell me yet more of these lovers and of their renown for of their loveliness is no need to tell and enya spoke again and she showed him where there stood a lady with a face like a flame of beauty shining marvellously and she said behold then deirdre that was born to be a death to many and a tale of wonder for ever and with her is nisha son of usnach that loved her greatly for when he saw her the first time there and then he gave her the love that he never gave to living thing to vision or to creature but to herself alone notwithstanding she has a little grave apart and there also is niev that kushalan loved and with three kisses she sent him to his death and there is eileen daughter of louis and bale of the honey-mouth that died for each other upon false tidings of their death and there is nicolette the slave-girl that was by rights the daughter of a king and had twelve princes to her brothers and beside her is her lord that was her lover through all and okasan he was called and count of beaucaire thereafter and they four which haunt apart by two and by two together they are leila and majnun whose love is the song of araby and the mirror of the east and they are valer and hadije that were parted by land and by sea yet at the last they came together by the secret road of dreams so enya made an end of her telling and ewan moved not but continued looking upon the ship and upon them that were therein and his heart rejoiced in those mighty dead and in the grandeur of the dooms that he had heard told of them and the ship came onward and was driven of the oarsmen upon the beach and they called to ewan and enya that they should come aboard so they took hands together and went aboard and they were received joyfully of all those knights and ladies and the ship was thrust strongly out from off the beach and so turned seaward and the sails were hoised upon the masts 
and the wind filled them roundly and all they that were aboard began to sing and ewan knew not the song which they sang but he perceived that it was a song of the rhymer's making for when he heard it he was mightily comforted and he felt the springs of life leaping up within him and the ship drave onward over foam and furrow and came swiftly upon a coast that was no strange coast for upon it was the high steep of palador and the horn was blown again from the topmost of the city and by seeming that sound was well known of the lovers that were in the ship for when they heard it they smiled and looked kindly upon one another as remembering old sorrow long since lightened and they brought ewan and enya to land and kissed them and bade them be of good courage and so to meet with them again for they said how their fellowship was an ever during fellowship and might never be broken then the ship put off from shore and went slowly to the westward and it was no more seen for it became as it had been a wreath of mist upon the water and ewan and enya climbed the steep together and came into the city and the dusk was falling round them and a great star stood over palador chapter fifty three how ewan and enya came to palador the last time and how the snow fell all night long then they looked upon that star and as they looked they marvelled and were dismayed for a great cloud came up and took the star from them utterly and with the cloud came a wind exceeding cold and bitter and they perceived how that in one hour the year was turned to winter and the wind got hold upon their bones and shrunk them and their hearts were sick with silence and foreboding then the wind fell again suddenly and the snow began to come thickly down the air and it came upon their faces now driving and now feathering in manner as the wind was still or gusty so they bent down their heads and went through the city at speed devising whither they should go and of whom they should seek counsel and as they went they met one which passed them by yet by seeming he knew them as he passed and he stayed and turned him about upon the street and he called to them not but he made haste and followed after them and when he was come near he looked about him warily and came nearer yet and ewan peered at him through the darkness and the snow falling and he perceived that he was dennis that had been friend and fellow to him and for all the pains and curses that were against him ewan misdoubted not of his faith and as he trusted so it was for dennis took him and pressed his hand and he pressed it strongly in token of friendship but he spoke no word then ewan thought on danger and remembered him of his enemies and he bade dennis go before in a manner of one that had no knowledge of any beside himself and so bring them to some place where they might speak together and dennis went quickly before and brought them into enya's own house that was long time deserted and out of mind of all men and when they were come there they entered in full silently for they spoke no word and their feet were dumb with snow and they climbed the stairs groping and came into the upper chamber that was enya's and made fast the door and they darkened the window and kindled a little fire upon the hearth and the fire took hold and grew and they had joy of it for in a fire there will be comfort against misery as in a thing that hath life and fellowship then they began to speak together and ewan asked of dennis what should be the meaning of the horn which he had heard blowing and thereat dennis was astonished as one that understands not what is asked of him and at the last he said to ewan whence are you come hither and by what error deceived for there has no horn been blown in palador this year then he said again it is a marvel for the blowing of the horn is for to-morrow and it is agreed among us that at the sound of it the eagles shall draw together and make war against them of the tower then said ewan so be it and good end thereto yet without doubt i heard the horn and for that sake only did i come hither and enya said i also heard it and no marvel for there is a hearing of the spirit and many times one friend may perceive another's counsel and as well far as near and as well before as after and to that dennis gave assent 
for he had heard the same of certain others and he told ewan and enya of the council of the eagles for their purpose was to bring in hubert and all other banished men and they would have no more such banishing henceforth but all to live and let live and they devised to go upon their enemies by two ways and so come against them unaware and namely that one party should take the gate and the other party the great hall for that hall was the chief place of the city where was ever the concourse and the government and there should be their stronghold and the blowing of the horn and at the sound of the horn should come hubert and his before the gate and so to break in with force and though their emprise was hazardous yet they looked to achieve it seeing that the prince of palador was suddenly departed out of this life without survivors to inherit him and by likelihood the great ones would be in confusion so all these counsels dennis showed unto ewan and enya and it was long before he made an end of speaking and when he had made an end they three sat silent looking upon the fire and the logs crumbled upon the hearth and the fire began to fail and ewan rose up and unbarred the window to behold the night and the snow fell without ceasing and it lay in a great crust upon the sill then ewan sighed and shut to the window for he was aweary of the darkness and he took wood and kindled the fire again blowing upon the ashes with his breath and they three outwore the night together speaking of old things and things to come and watching for the dawn chapter fifty four how the horn was given into ewan's hand and how he sounded thereon a mort royal and when it began to lighten towards dawn then they went forth out of the house and made to go by the way of the market-place and the snow had ceased from falling and it lay upon the ground before them deep and white for it was as yet untrodden so they drew their cloaks about their faces and went quickly to the intent that they should be known of none and at the first there was no living soul that met with them but afterward they had sight of three or four which came towards them and by seeming they were the servants of some great one accompanying with their master homeward and ewan saw the lord of those men coming behind them and he knew him well for all that he was enwrapped against the cold and they drew near to pass by one another for there was no avoidance and the lord gave ewan greeting and would have stayed him but ewan muttered somewhat and so passed on and enya and dennis with him and in truth this was sir reynold that was ever busy against other and more especially against the eagles and when he saw ewan though he saw not his face yet he misdoubted him who he was and ewan looked after him as he went and he saw how he stood staring upon the footprints in the snow and when he had considered them he followed them backwardly that he might find the house from whence they had set forth then ewan turned him to dennis and he said what now for we must make short work and dennis stayed not but ran quickly towards the great hall and ewan and enya followed after him and with a key dennis opened the door of the hall and they three entered in and there was no man within but upon the wall was a great horn hanging and dennis took down the horn from the wall and gave it into ewan's hand but ewan said how shall i blow for war that i know but the hunter's notes for belike you have another manner for war or else you are agreed among yourselves and dennis answered him not so but the sounding of the horn is enough and no matter the music for this is an ancient horn and a magical and there is none among us that is able to sound it save hubert only but it may be that you also are able for there was a power upon you from the beginning then ewan went forth and stood before the door and looked out over the city and he saw it as a town of fairy for it was new and soft with snow and he set the horn to his mouth and blew therein with all his strength and the note that he sounded was a mort royal for he said within himself god willing we have hunted an evil thing to death and the sound of the horn blared out and went wide upon the air and it came loudly into all the quarters of the city and into every street and every house and there was no man in palador that heard it not 
and they which heard it were awoke out of sleep and the most of them groaned and turned them to their sleep again but upon others came fear and hatred and they got them quickly to their armour and the eagles also heard it and were glad and they did on their swords which they kept in hiding and issued forth to go upon their enemies but ewan stood upon the head of the steps that were before the hall and he looked out over the city and saw no man stirring nor he heard no sound of feet and fear came upon him and loneliness and he thought upon enya and said to her o my beloved i have brought you to your death and she answered him proudly nay not yet for you have sounded but once and there are many faithful then ewan took the horn and blew it the second time and all they which were his began to run towards the place where he was and they ran quickly as men that thought not on danger for joy that the time was come and ewan saw them how they came running and his heart was uplifted with their joy and their fellowship and his blood within him became like wine and he set the horn to his mouth and blew it yet a third time louder than before and the sound of it smote the walls of palador and the gates and the towers and the houses great and little and all the whole city rang therewith and the air trembled and the sky was filled with echoes then the desire of battle came upon the eagles and they ran together to ewan and thronged upon the steps before him and they lifted up their swords and shouted as it were one man and the noise of their shouting went up mightily and was mingled with the echoes of the horn end of part eighteen